text as recorded by the author John, chapter 9, I'm sorry, John chapter 3, it's verse 9, <laughs> John chapter 3 and verse 9, beginning at verse 9, and when you found the text, would you stand with me today in honor of the reading of God's word, beginning at verse 9, and we'll read through verse 18. And the word of the Lord reads, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify what we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Would you bow your heads with me? King Jesus, we love you so much today, God. The time has come, Lord, for the word of the Lord to go forth for the benefit of your people's souls. And we ask God today that your anointing would rest upon your messenger. Help us, God, to deliver this wonderful word of truth that you placed in my spirit for this hour and this time. Lord, that those that are in this place might be blessed, that those that might hear this message by tape will be blessed, that those that might hear it over the internet, God, might also be blessed. For Lord, in and of myself, there's nothing I can say that would benefit anyone. But Lord, rather, if your anointing would rest upon me and help me, God, Bring quicken within my spirit every thought you'd have me to share, every word that ought to be spoken. Oh, God, then we might leave this place different than we came, challenged, changed, encouraged, inspired. For we ask it, Master, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated today. Amen. There's an old song that we used to sing in the church when I have to, well, it's not that old, but I'm making it sound like one of the old hymns of the church. It's not an old hymn of the church or anything, but it's a song that said, hey, I'm a believer now, since Jesus changed my mind. Yes, I'm a believer now, everything is going to be fine. Well, I'm a believer now. Everybody's going to see that, yes, I'm a believer now, since Jesus set me free. It actually dates back, you can kind of tell by the sound of it, it dates back to the 70s. It's kind of popular in the church during the 70s. Hey, I'm a believer now. I don't know about you, but I'm a believer. Amen, aren't you? Amen. You know, when a salesman wants to sell a product, he'll demonstrate that product for you. He'll show you all the bells and all the whistles. He'll show you all the features and all the benefits. And if he's a good salesman, he'll convince you of your need for this product by reason of his demonstration. Amen? Now, if the product he is selling is something you don't need, it won't matter how much he demonstrates it. It won't matter how much he shows you. You will not find a need for it. Amen? I mean, uh, if you have a product that is specifically designed for women, and it is, you know, uh, made very specifically for women, and a salesman comes and tries to show you as a man this product, you have no call for it because it's not made for you. Amen? So no matter how lovely it might be, no matter how wonderful it might be, you don't have any call for that particular product. But if it's something you need, 
then every single be uh, feature he shows you, every single thing about that product he shows you is going to help you realize more and more that you want it. Amen. You need a car. So you go to the lot and you're looking at cars. And the man begins to show you this automobile. And you like the way it looks before you ever get in it. But you know what? The more he shows you about that car, the more features he begins to demonstrate about that vehicle, the more you learn about things that car can do that you didn't even know cars could do. The more you want it, and you want it, and you want it. I want you to know today, children, the same is true of the love of God and the grace of God. We read a portion of John chapter 3 today that's kind of an unusual portion, and I know that it was. You see, a lot of times, of course, when you hear people speak of John chapter 3, immediately they're going to go into the conversation that Nicodemus had with Jesus about a man being born again, but we didn't go there this morning. No, I wanted to go to that portion of that chapter that helps us to see that the love of God is the product that God is selling today. The love of God is the thing that God was demonstrating in sending the Lord Jesus Christ to planet Earth. And if there's anything you and I need to buy into today, it's the love of God. Amen? Amen. You see, I'm going to... I have this habit. I, I preach. A, I have a very different preaching style than a lot of people do. But I'm going to kind of turn this thing around a little bit today. Probably different than anything you've ever heard it preached before. Many in our world refuse to believe the claims of an advertisement or of a firm or uh, some product until it has been properly and fully demonstrated to them. Uh, you know, some people say, I won't believe it in, until I see it. It's got to be demonstrated right in front of their eyes. They're not going to believe it until they see it with their own eyes. Uh, do you ever feel that way about some things? You'll see an ad on TV for something and say, yeah, well, uh, I'll believe it when I see it. Amen. Because uh, now I've got to see that demonstrated right in front of me before I'm going to believe what they're claiming. Even so today, humanity needs to look at the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ if we are to even begin to believe what God is selling. And what's He selling? He's selling salvation. He's selling grace. He's selling forgiveness. He's selling remission of sins. He's selling truth. He's selling eternal life. But all these things come through the vehicle that is the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. You can't be a believer until you understand, children, that the product you've got to believe in today is the love of God. It was the love of God that brought Jesus Christ to planet Earth. Many preachers want to tell you that it was the love of God that put him on the cross, but I've got news for you. It was the love of God that brought him to the manger to begin with. Amen. He had never reached the cross if it weren't for the manger. He had never gotten there if he hadn't started here. And it was the love of God that brought him first to us. So many churches, they like to focus on the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by no means this morning do I want to subtract from the crucifixion. By no means do I mean to distract from or detract from the importance of the Lord's death. That's not what I'm trying to do. But I believe God wants us to understand something this morning like we never understood it before. We are not merely to focus on the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and focus on that as being the manifestation of God's love. No! The manifestation of God's love was the life of Jesus Christ and not just his death. Amen. Romans 5, 6 through 10, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet preadventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. 
But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were the enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, how much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. By his life. See, we focus so much on the death that we forget sometimes about the life. I hear some preachers preach so much about the cross that they never preach about the Jesus who hung on the cross. Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But he didn't say just the crucifixion. He said, except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So I've got news for you. If you don't know who Jesus is, then all the preachers in the world can talk about the crucifixion, and it will do you no good, and you'll not see the love of God manifest in the cross of Calvary. I don't see the love of God there. I see cruelty. I see pain. I see torment. I see torture. But when you look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, you see the love of God. You see the love of God walking and talking and living and breathing amongst human beings, manifesting to us the very nature of the God we serve. The Bible said, no man has seen God at any time, but the one that we call Jesus manifested him to us. He has revealed him to us. When you look at Jesus, you're seeing God. When you're looking into the face of Christ, you're looking into the face of God. When you see the love and the grace and the mercy and the compassion of the man Jesus Christ, then you understand the nature of the God who wants you to serve Him and know Him and love Him. But you can't fall in love with somebody who's only dying on a cross. You've got to fall in love with somebody who the Bible says loved you first. His love wasn't just manifest for humanity when he died on the cross. No, his love was manifest for humanity when he looked at that little lady and said, Neither do I condemn you. <laughs> Go and sin no more. We just read it in our primary text this morning, John chapter 3, verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's how come Jesus was able to look at that lady who was brought to him in the very act of adultery. You see, so many preachers today want to preach the letter of the law, but Jesus Christ did not follow the letter. For had he followed the letter, he'd have stoned that woman. Amen. Had he followed the letter, that woman would have been dead right then and there. But instead, he looked at her. And he exercised something that only God can exercise, and that is absolute authority and grace. And he said, neither do I condemn you. I didn't come here to condemn you, honey. I didn't come here to use the law as a means of beating you over the head. I didn't, bring, I didn't come here so that I could bring you to me and just beat you silly with the letter of the law. No, 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 no. That's not why I've come. I haven't come to condemn. I've come to save. And in our primary text today, we read that whosoever believeth on him shall have everlasting life. Because it's not about the law anymore. The Bible says, the Apostle Paul writes and says that if anybody was an expert on the law, it was Paul. He said, you're either going to follow grace or you're going to follow the law. He said, you try to have both, you can't. You can only have one or the other. Choose. You know, we've got churches today that call themselves Christians that spend more of their time uh, in the pulpit trying to articulate the Old Testament law, come on now, than they do to preach the Christ of the New Testament. Amen. 
And what they don't realize in doing this is, the Apostle Paul said, to be guilty of one point of the law is to be guilty of all. He said, if you choose the law, if you choose to try to follow the law, if you choose to try to live up to the edicts of the law, he said, then honey, I've got news for you. You are responsible at that moment in time for every single point in that law. Mm. Well, what do you mean, preacher? I can't have my lobster dinner over at Red Lobster anymore? No, you can't. Because to do so, you would be violating the law. You hear me? You can't eat shellfish anymore because to do so, you'd be violating the law. Well, no, 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 no. I, it's not about eating shellfish. It's about condemning this person or that person because they do something that the law said was wrong or they do something that the law said were wrong or they do something. Well, honey, if you're going to live by the law, you've got to live by the whole thing. You can't pick and choose. When is Christianity going to get it through their head that this is the truth. This is what the Word of God, this is what the apostles of Jesus Christ taught us. When are they going to stop trying to preach people into condemnation and guilt by preaching the torments of Calvary and begin to preach people into a love relationship with Jesus Christ by preaching the loving, wonderful, merciful, compassionate Savior who walked on this earth for 33 years. They spend most of their time preaching the last few hours of his life and ignoring the 33 years that led up to those few hours. I know churches, I know people today, do they emulate as Christians, do they emulate the personality of Jesus Christ? Do they emulate the behavior of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do they act like he does? No, we've got Fred Phelps who calls himself a born-again Christian who grabs up a sign that says God hates homosexuals, God hates fags, God hates queers, and carries this at the funeral of a young man who was murdered. But thinks he's justified in doing so. Thinks he has good cause for doing so. Mr. Phelps, you're a fool. You're a buffoon and an idiot. That's what you are. And if you were here not too long ago, I preached a message on a Sunday evening about choosing your judgment. And you remember the fact that I talked about those of us who've come to experience the grace of God and who then walk like Jesus did without judgment, without condemnation, without looking down your nose on everybody around you and about you. You stand before God in the judgment. Do this. You'll stand before God pure. You'll stand before God as your king and not as your judge. But the Lord said, but go ahead and be like that servant who was forgiven much, who turned around and went out and immediately tried to require much of someone else. So go ahead and act like that. Go ahead and be like Fred Fett. Fred Fett ought to be so glad for the grace of God in his own life that he hasn't got an ounce of condemnation in his soul for anybody. I don't care how bad he dislikes their behavior. I don't care how bad he disagrees with their lifestyle, quote unquote. Because his behavior is going to place him on the judgment day on the wrong side of the bar. Because the pardon that God may have one day given him at Calvary when he first believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, he will have traded it in, brother, and instead decided that he was going to appeal that decision. How many people you know appeal a pardon? Not too many, not if they're smart. But don't you know today, there are lots of Christians who are appealing their pardons. God has given them a pardon. But when they turn around and look upon someone else with judgment and with condemnation and with wrath, I've got news for you. Jesus said, judge not, least you be judged. Said, as long as you don't judge, there'll be no judgment for you. Because judge not, least you be judged. If 
you want to be judged, start judging. And that will guarantee that you take the pardon God gave you, rip it up into shreds, pour it out on the ground, and now you stand before Him like every unbeliever on the street. And He's going to judge you now, not based on that pardon. No, no, no. He's going to judge you now based upon your actions, based upon your words, based upon your motivations. I'd rather be, I'd rather stand before God and be judged by the grace of God, wouldn't you? Amen. I don't want to be judged by my words. I don't want to be judged by my actions. I don't want to be judged by my conduct or my behavior. I want to be judged by the grace of God. And the only way I can assure that today is to realize that God is trying to sell me a bill of goods. He's trying to sell us today eternal life. He's trying to sell us today redemption. He's trying to sell us grace. But honey, all those things are just accessories to the primary product, which is the love of God. And if as the people of God today will learn to buy into the love of God, if we learn to treat the world around us with the love of God, if we learn to emulate the life, the ministry, the personality of the Lord Jesus Christ, then when that trumpet blows and we stand before God, there'll be no judgment for us. There'll be no judgment. The Lord said the only time there's judgment is when you have judged. Judge not, least ye be judged. You understand the English language? Least ye be judged, lest ye be judged. In other words, as long as you're not judging, there won't be a judgment for you. Not in that sense of a act by act, count by count. He said, but if you start judging, then the same measure you judge by is the same measure that, you, that you're going to be judged by. If you start condemning, he said, the same condemnation that you have for others is the same level of condemnation that you will be measured out to again. Is that not what the Word of God tells us? Yes, it is. So we need to stop focusing only and solely on the cross of Calvary and the Lord Jesus Christ hanging there as our sacrifice. And we need to focus on His life. Because there we see the love of God manifest. There we see the love of God illustrated. There we see the love of God, here's the key word, demonstrated. I'm not going to buy nothing I haven't seen demonstrated. Amen. I can't buy into anything I haven't seen demonstrated. But you know what? When I read John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When I read those words, and I see God loved the world, sure He did. But you know what? I look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I see the love of God demonstrated for me. When he met the little woman at the well, who had been divorced and remarried several times, and he could have easily condemned her in this. But instead, he just said, you have well said. And then he moved on. Well, all right, that's, you, you've described your situation pretty well. Now let's go on from here. I've got news for you, honey. All God wants to do is meet people where they are so that he can take you past that. Amen? So he can take you where you're at, and you can go from there. He's not interested in condemning you for where you've been. He's not interested in condemning you for what you've done. He's not interested in condemning you for what your past shows. That's the love of God. That's, that's the demonstration of the love of God that I'm looking for that helps me to know how great and how marvelous a product this thing is. And the woman is brought to him in the very act of adultery. The Lord says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That's the love of God I want. Amen. So many focus on the death of the Lord as his ultimate expression of love. But I have news for you today. Whether he died by painful torture, which indeed was the nature of crucifixion, or whether he died by one swift blow of the sword, severing his head from his neck. It doesn't matter. What matters simply is that 
he died. He didn't have to, but he had to want to. He didn't have to die, but he had to want to. If he did not want to die, it would have been impossible to have killed him. So he had to want to. He had to be willing to surrender to the cold, dark hand of death. How could the creator of all the universe do such a thing? It's called love. Notice, however, that in Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, Paul ends his statements with the phrase, We shall be saved by his life. It is not in his death for salvation life, but in his life. For had he lived a demonic life and died, his life would have meant nothing. But because he lived the grace and truth of God, we are saved. Hallelujah. So many want to preach the gruesome nature of the crucifixion in an effort to shame wayward souls into believing. But today I preach the life of Jesus Christ, a demonstration of the love of our God. Believe today because he loves you and not merely because he died for you. I hope you're following my line of logic and my reasoning this morning. His death was but one short leg in a journey that lasted three, 33 and a half years. Folks, I want you to understand today we need to believe the gospel of Christ today not because of the way he died but because of the way he lived. Because it was the way he lived that demonstrated his love for us. If he'd have had his head chopped off in a guillotine instead of being crucified, it would not have made his love any less for us. Are you following what I'm trying to say? So the way he died is not a demonstration of his love. The way he lived was a demonstration of his love. And his willingness to die was a demonstration of his love. He did not come to condemn but to save. Neither do I condemn you, he said. Go and sin no more. These were his trademark phrases. His was a life of love and grace, full of mercy, and abounding in affirmation for all who came to him. His boldest words of condemnation were never spoken in opposition to those who we might today label as homosexuals, drunkards, divorcees, or even whoremongers, murderers, or liars. No, that's not where the Lord's greatest, heaviest words of condemnation lie. No, they, his most passionate words of condemnation were spoken against those who lived in hypocrisy, representing themselves to be one thing, when in truth they were something very different. Amen. I could go into a big old tale right now about good old Jerry Falwell up there in Lynchburg, Virginia. Probably not a fouler human being on the face of this planet. Do people dirty every chance he gets? He's got a reputation goes back to that when he was a young person. But he'll get up on TV and he'll condemn everybody he doesn't think they're living up to what he thinks is a Christian standard. He stinks like a grave on the inside, but he whitewashes it and makes them look pretty on the outside. And foolish, simple-minded people believe it. That's why I just let people live their lives, and if they're trying to serve God, brother, I let them try to serve God. If I don't agree with every little thing they're doing, that's all right. It's not my job to agree. It's not my job to judge. God didn't appoint me judge. He encouraged me to, uh, he called me to encourage people to be all that they can be as God's people. And that's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to condemn them. I'm not going to criticize them. I'm going to encourage them to step up higher and keep going. Amen. And just keep becoming something better and bigger until you finally reach your goal. Children, today we need to look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and believe. We need to see the demonstration of God's love in His life. 
and believe. Hey, I'm a believer now. Why? Because I've seen the demonstration. I believe in Electrolux because I've seen it demonstrated. Amen. I believe in the love of God because I've seen it demonstrated. And in believing, we will be saved. That's what we read in our primary text today. That's the promise of Scripture. If you believe, you will be saved. Amen. Would you stand with me today? I told you I try to keep things unnecessarily long. I don't like to make them unnecessarily long. <clears throat> and I just want to point out to you, first of all, we have dinner here today, if you want to set meat with us. We brought some roast and potatoes and stuff to kind of to save everybody some money because I know everybody's on a tight budget these days. But I also would like to ask, uh, and I ask this, I want to make this point as well. I, I'm asking this for the benefit of the tape, to be honest with you, as well as I am for those in the room. So don't feel that I'm putting anybody on the spot. But uh, our church has really been struggling financially since we lost our building. Uh, we've been able to keep everything going. We lost a lot of people. We lost, uh, not a lot of people, about six or eight people, I guess. And uh, that was probably... 80% of our financial support that went right down the drain. And uh, I would just ask you to be prayerful. If the Lord should lay upon your heart and you're able, if you could help us with an offering or time, we would appreciate it. Uh, there's never any pressure. One thing about our church, you'll notice we do not pass an offering plate. You say, well, there's so few of us here today would have been ignorant to pass an offering plate. But even if we had 100 I've pastored churches with over well over 100 people, and I never passed an offering plate. In 20 years of pastoring, I've never passed an offering plate. I do it the same way today. I've always done it. We have these little treasuries right here. There's one at the back of the church. There's one at the front. And if there's envelopes, if you want to record, if it's a cash gift and you want to make a record of who's giving or what have you, you can do that. But anyway, I just point that out to you. If you can help us, we can use all the help we can get. Uh, right now, we are in the read by about probably $500, I think, and I hate to operate in the red. And uh, But uh, we're going to keep this ministry going. As you know, there'll be more people here tonight. You know, this morning's a little sparse, but there'll be more people here tonight. And uh, th everybody that's part of this church counts on this church. Amen? And so we want to keep this ministry going. We have people on the Internet. Do you want to believe I've gotten at least, what, half a dozen or so emails this week from people who love our tape ministry and said, Brother Mar, please keep sending tapes because we need your tapes. I don't know if you realize it or not, but our, the message we preach here is a lot different than a lot of churches preach. Uh, for one thing, I think ultimately it's a lot more positive. Amen. And, and people rely on that. They need that. So if you can help us, we invite you to do so, okay? Amen. Would you bow your head with me? Master, we love you so much today. Why? Because you first loved us. How do we know you loved us? Because you came and you demonstrated your love for us. Lord, you lived a life that was full of love and grace and truth. You lived a life, God, that was devoid of judgment and criticism and condemnation. Master, today we just ask, God, that you would help this message to find its way into the heart of every hearer. Lord Jesus, help us today to understand that your life is what we ought to study. For your life is the demonstration of your love. Your death was the means to an end. And the way in which you died was not the least bit important in terms of demonstrating your love. It was not greater love because you were crucified. It was the greatest love because the God of all the universe was willing to surrender himself to death, even the death of the cross as Paul wrote. Master, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. Go with us, we pray. Bless the food, the fellowship, the time we have together. For we ask it all in the precious, lovely name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you and amen.